earlier this year, I bought my first new car. It was the biggest purchase of my life. About three months later, a bus rear-ended my car. My cousin Matthew and I were in a car, and we were wearing seat belts, so we were okay. The bus was only running less than 20 kilometers an hour. But now imagine, if we were on a highway, the bus had run full speed and hit my car. Would the seat belts be enough to keep us safe? Chances are, the seat belt would have kept Matt safer than they would have kept me. Until 2011, seat belts were tested only on male versions of crash test dummies. This means that they were more accurate for men. Men were taller than women, larger frame, and heavier. As a result, women are more likely to get injured in a car crash, despite wearing a seat belt. You'll find a lot of similar situations in other fields. Doctors trained to recognize heart attack in male, often misdiagnosed women. Air conditioning in this room, for example, is calibrated for men. Even the size of your mobile phones is designed to fit the bigger man's hand. When our world and our scientists and engineers are mostly men, they naturally design products for men. We are most familiar with our own context, after all. In a world that is becoming more technologically focused, where algorithms decide which resumes make it to the senior executive mailboxes, when designers and engineers decide how we interact with our phones, when our health and safety depend on scientists and engineers, we need more women to code, to build products, to engineer solutions so things work for both genders. I never used to think about gender differences in STEM. I was pretty much unaware. All I knew was that I liked science and later engineering, starting with chemical engineering, then biomedical engineering. I continued with material science, and then I became the first person with a PhD in my family. I thought that if I could do it, everybody else could do it too. Doesn't matter if you're a male or female. After all, our DNA is very similar. They are not that much different. As a bioengineer, I often turn to biology for inspirations, sometimes to help me understand why things are different or similar. These are illustrations of our chromosomes, packed DNA carrying genes that make us human. Look at them. Can you spot the differences? They all look quite similar, don't they? All 22 pairs of them, except perhaps for that one last pair. The pair that determine whether a person were to be a female by having two X chromosomes, or a male by having one X and one Y. That little last one, they can't be the determining factor, can they? So I didn't give it so much thought. I continued with my research, and then came the turning point. About six years ago, I was awarded the Singapore for Women in Science National Fellowship. A total surprise. After the initial bliss came the nerve-wracking reality. I would be doing a lot of interviews for the whole year, talking about my research topic to my peers, no problems. But then articulating it to the general public is a completely different ballgame. And then reporters like to ask me about challenges, issues pertaining women in engineering, women in science. That topic was completely unfamiliar to me. Were there even issues? So I approached it with, I used to, with my scientific, when I have a scientific problems, establish the baseline. What I found really shocked me. Only about 14 to 25 percent of STEM workforces are female. That is kind of low. I was expecting a number closer to 50 percent. More alarmingly, that number is dropping. Why was the number so low? 
So I dug deeper. A comprehensive report by the American Association of University Women summarized three points why so few women in STEM. First, society. The negative stereotype that women or girls cannot do STEM imposes the self-belief that they need to be exceptionally good to succeed in the field. Second, the college, university. Lack of broader overview of the field as well as integration of female faculty members. The third, biases, conscious or unconscious. More people associate math and science to boys or male, and art and humanities with female. That was quite daunting. The issue was so complex, I didn't even know how to start come to work toward a solution. My brain then screamed, this is not something for me to worry about. And after all, I survived, and I will continue to do so. But then one thing became very clear to me. I had one year to do something meaningful before the next fellow came on board. And then my platform would be gone. So I fell back on my engineering training. As an engineer, I am equipped with the tool to devise a solution when I'm presented with a problem. I would call them the five T's. We trim, trace, test, tweak, and track. So first I trim the problems. Focus on only one thing, the university. This is where I worked, and this is where I wanted to do something. I had a supportive environment throughout my academic career. I was never told I could not do STEM. In fact, I was actually encouraged to take them up. I had, and still have, great role models and great mentors. But others may not have the same experience I had. One question still nagged me. Where did the drop start? Was it at the bachelor's level? Master's level, doctorate level, or postdoctorate level. So, naturally, I trace the data. These are more recent data on the percentage of female students at the bachelor's level, master's and doctorate level, as well as postdoctoral trainees at the College of Engineering. The numbers haven't changed much over the years. Now that I knew that the average world female in a STEM workforce is ranged between 14 and 25 percent, the number that we have at 30 percent for bachelor's and master's level are not too bad. Then the number just drops slightly to about 22 percent by the time they reach a postdoctoral level. But then my assumptions were thrown out completely out of the window when I looked at the data from the College of Science. Started very strongly at 56% at bachelor's level, and by the time the, the trainees go to the postdoctoral level, the number goes to 26%. That is more than half. We are losing female trainees in the pipeline. The pipeline is leaky. Clearly, something needed to be done. So if all the young ones, male scientists, it would be easy to believe that science and engineering are male domains. Could I not feature women engineers and scientists so that there would be more role models for the young ones? I decided that would be ground zero. And then the first prototype was born. The Women in Engineering Science and Technology Symposium with the goal to encourage, inspire young women in our society to engage and persist in the curiosity-driven world of engineering, science, and tech. After we decided on a prototype, we went to test it. In 2014, supported by Dan School Chair, we held the inaugural symposium for, on the 7th of November. That was Marie Curie's birthday. Did you know that Marie Curie is the first woman to win the Nobel Prize? And guess what? She won it twice. First, in 1903, for physics, and 1911, for chemistry. 
And to date, she is still the only person to have two Nobel Prizes in two different sciences. The first symposium featured prominent scientists from different age groups. The president of NTU opened it, and then the provost closed it. Our keynote speaker was Ada Yonath, the fifth woman to win the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And the last woman won the prize 45 years before she did. So at the time, she often joked that, you know, she was the only female chemistry laureate who was still alive. We also invited female students from the middle school so we, because we thought it was important for them to interact with successful scientists and engineers. We got good response. The room was almost full. Unexpectedly, we had a private donor who decided to donate and fund our initiatives with a six-digit sum. Encouraged, we tweaked the program. We recognized that a vulnerable point in the pipeline are early career scientists and engineers. So after discussion with a senior colleague, we established the Women in Engineering, Science and Technology conference grant to provide these young women to present and their work and to build networks, gain visibility, and stay in the field. So in 2018, Symposium, we featured them together with the first woman to win the Millennium Technology Prize, Frances Arnold, who later in that year became the sixth female Nobel laureate in chemistry, keeping Ada in good company. We gained more tractions. The deans of the Colleges of Engineering and Science decided to match the fund from the private donors, and now we have enough funding to run the conference grant until 2024. I now realize how important it is to get support from the higher management and to drive bigger changes. The associate provost gave us the green light, and the more I talk to my peers, my colleagues, even my students, the more I realize there are a lot of like-minded people right here on campus. So with all that momentum, just last year in 2018, together with a colleague, we launched the Women at NTU, a platform to advance and promote women's role in academia and beyond. Two companies took notice of our activities and sponsored more initiatives. Women Fest, featuring talks by the NTU academics, and more importantly, engaging men in the conversation. And we also had the first all-female hardware hackathon in Singapore held just last week, right here on campus. It's been five years now. How do we know that we are driving results and not just activities? Will we see more female students and postdoc trainees in STEM in the future? We need to track the outcome by monitoring the percentage of female students over the years. Only then, we can come up with better approach and to increase the percentage. So recently, with the endorsement of three deans and three companies, my co-chair and I wrote a, submitted a grant proposal to the Ministry of Education to do just that. And I'm very happy to share that the grant was uh, confirmed to be approved just two weeks ago. And it allows us not only to track participation in women in STEM, but also to promote it in Singapore. <laughs> now I'd like to take you back to the story on the crash test dummies. Today, crash tests are done not only on male versions of the dummies, but also on female and child versions. That's a good start. But there are more to do. A lot of strategies to develop, systems to improve. We need more female engineers to make a better world. Without women having a sizable representation in the areas of engineering, science, and technology, less attention 
will be given to issues and problems important to women. Every bit counts. For me, I have used the 5T approach to turn my unawareness into actions. Now over to you. What will you engineer?